Welcome to the two-part webinar series on equity, justice, and inclusion for older workers. Today's webinar, Enhancing Economic Security for Older, Low-Wage Workers, was organized by the Sloan Research Network on Aging and Work. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the GSA website. A notice to all attendees will be distributed once the recording is available. A question and answer session will immediately follow the live presentation. We will be accepting questions through the questions feature accessible on the right-hand side of your screen. Also located there are downloadable handouts for today, including copies of the presentation slides. Opening today's webinar is uh, Jacqueline B. James, Director of the Sloan Research Network on Aging and Work and Co-Director of the Center on Aging and Work at Boston College, and Kendra Jason, Assistant Professor of Sociology at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte and a member of the Steering Committee for the Sloan Research Network on Aging and Work. Without further delay, I'll hand the microphone to Jackie. Next slide. Thank you so much, and thank all of you for joining us today for this important series sponsored by the Sloan Research Network on Aging and Work. For those of you who don't know, the network is an international multidisciplinary organization. It was founded in 2014 at Boston College with a generous grant from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. As noted here, our mission is to create and support a professional network of researchers who are interested in, in this changing context of aging and work. Currently, there are over 281 members from 21 countries and more than two dozen disciplines. Next slide, please. As we are for the last two years or so, the network has had a particular focus on justice, equity, and inclusion. On behalf of the network, Kendra and I are happy to welcome you to this event that represents the culmination of much of that work. Now I would like to introduce my colleague, Kendra Jason, who will tell you more about this series and introduce our speakers for today. Thank you, Jackie. We are very excited to have three action-packed presentations. This is part two of our system of inequality affecting um, older workers. We really want to focus on recommendations and solutions to help those um, and to, to think more about workers that are often not included in mainstream discourse. Um, we're talking about older worker issues. We have um, Ab Abby Hilsinger. Um, he'll be talking with colleagues on identifying amenable barriers to engage underserved minority, middle-aged, and older adult learners in adult educational opportunities. Bita Bio and Karen Fortina will be speaking on older adult peer specialist role in offsetting the impact of social distancing during the COVID-19 pandemic. And Jennifer Kraft Morgan and Elizabeth Burgess will be talking talking on microlearning for low-wage workers in nursing homes. I also do want to add that there is a handout available of this presentation um, for you. Now I'll turn it over to Abby Hilsinger. Thank you. Thanks, Kendra. And we can move on to the next slide. And since we were just introduced, let's jump right in to the next slide. Wonderful. So, um, you know, after participating in this webinar, really what we hope you come away with is understanding what barriers exist and what strategies are available to engage and retain underserved minority, middle-aged, and older persons in adult education and training. And we'll also highlight how COVID-19 has especially impacted racial and ethnic minorities. So moving on to the next slide. Uh, we're going to just talk very briefly about background and methodology. So on the next slide, we'll see background, um, participating in adult education and training, which we'll call AET, is critical to have skills demanded by employers. However, despite the growing need for AET globally, opportunities to engage in AET are most often pursued by higher income or higher skilled adults. So what we're seeing is those who often need these opportunities the most are least likely to take advantage of them. 
Uh, engaging and retaining ethnic and racial minority Middle Asian older adults is often challenging because there are barriers, and we'll talk a lot about those throughout this presentation. And then a lack of training opportunities for older workers may place them as, at a disadvantage. So some strategies are really needed. And finally, as I mentioned, COVID-19 has disproportionately impacted racial and ethnic minority groups. And we can see this on the next slide where we have unemployment rates by pre and post COVID-19, uh, also by race and ethnicity. So if we focus on the right-hand side of your slide, we see that uh, Blacks unemployment pre COVID-19 in February, 2020 was 13.8%. And that almost doubled uh, several months into COVID-19 in June, 2020 by 20 to 24.8%. If we're looking specifically at those with less than a high school diploma. And we're seeing increases in unemployment across all races and um, levels of education, but we can see this is disproportionate for Blacks. On the next slide, we have some more data related to COVID-19. And the takeaway here, if you'll click to animate, we see that 50% of Hispanics and 40, 2% of Blacks have either canceled or changed their education plans as a result of COVID-19 compared to just 26% of whites. So again, we're seeing this disparity among racial and ethnic groups. Moving on to the next slide, briefly methodology. This uh, project included semi-structured interviews and um, review of policy-related documents. We interviewed 52 key informants in multiple countries. On the next slide, uh, you can see situational barriers. And we're really gonna talk about situational, institutional, and dispositional barriers. Um, situational barriers include the cost of education, lack of time, lack of childcare, um, not having available uh, transportation, as well as lack of support from family and friends. And for the sake of time, we're gonna focus on cost of education, as you can see in the next slide. So when we're looking at financial barriers, I'm really I'm only gonna read the quotes that are bolded for the sake of time, but since you have, you'll have these as handouts, uh, you'll be able to review the remaining quotes that we're not gonna cover specifically in today's webinar. So this was a key informant from Australia, and they were talking about formal education for those aged 40 to 45, and our key informant said, those people don't have the ability to change direction because if you want to do formal educational training in Australia, if you want to do university education, it's going to cost you. And that means withdrawing from the workforce. So a powerful quote um, highlighting the financial barriers. On the next slide, we're going to highlight some strategies for overcoming these financial barriers. And particularly in the US, institutions and state officials should thoughtfully shape the expansion of Pell Grants and other financial opportunities, specifically for these pub, um, subpopulations that have had policies and practices and structures in place over time that have really led to inequitable outcomes. We should establish strategies to support the diverse needs presented by adult learners. And we know that institutions can't address all of these barriers on, the, on their own, um, but in partnering with community organizations to help address multiple barriers can be really helpful to meet all of these social service needs of our adult learners. In Norway, we heard that employers receive subsidies from the government to provide training in the workplace. And in Italy, adult learning opportunities are normally free of charge for the participant. Our quote here from Australia basically says that adult learning opportunities, especially uh, personal interest courses are incredibly cheap. Accredited training may incur some fees, but there are um, opportunities for reduced fees if individuals are unemployed. So if we look at the next slide, we're moving on to institutional barriers, and these include time required to complete an educational program, courses not being scheduled at a convenient time, which is important for um, our adult learners who have may have competing priorities, lack of information about educational programs, difficult enrollment processes, and then a lack of computer and internet access. So on the next slide, you can see we're gonna focus on technology. And our quote here, again from Australia, is older adults access to technology and skills is actually quite limited. 
and our quotes from Italy and Canada support this as well. On the next slide, we'll show some strategy. Oh, sorry, this, uh, this slide is a figure that really highlights the challenges related to securing reliable internet and computer access. And again, if you'll click to animate, you can see the uh, disparities by race and ethnicity for Hispanics and Blacks, <coughs> pardon me, who have indicated that it would be extremely or very challenging to secure reliable internet or computer access specifically for the purpose of um, education and training. Now, these, uh, this data is specifically in the US um, during COVID-19. And we'll look at some strategies on the next slide for um, focusing on technology. So one strategy is to offer additional support to students who lack familiarity with online learning and computers in general. But then also we need to ensure that students have access to both the internet and, compu and a computer at home. And whether this is through grants or funding sources that may be available or institutions working directly with internet providers who might offer low or no cost access to low income households. So on our next slide, we'll see our final barrier, which is dispositional barriers. And we're gonna spend most of our time here. This includes a lack of confidence and ability concern about being too old, being tired of school, or not enjoying studying. And on the next slide, we see a quote from a key informant that says, second chance learners, so those learners who were returning to study after having a checkered history of learning in school, they had very negative perceptions of themselves as learners, that they were stupid, that they couldn't learn, they'd never been a good learner, they didn't have the skill or capabilities to learn, which is terrible to think that these people had held these, you know, internal dialogues about their capacity to learn for so long. On the next slide, we see a quote related to concerns about being too old. And our key informant in Italy confirmed that by saying there are very few programs for people above the age of 45. Moving on, we have a quote about lack of motivation and confidence. And our key informant in Norway was really indicating that for individuals who lost their jobs during COVID-19, they were really looking to return back to their old job because of maybe confidence and motivation. They weren't learning to build a new skill set. They were really most interested in being able to return to their old work. In the next slide, another powerful quote around a relevant pedagogy, and it reads, Herein lies a fundamental problem with educational training. It assumes, it puts out curriculum that says, here's what you have to learn, here's what you have to know. It takes no account of what people already know. A lot of people have had really rich lives. They can do almost anything. They can't necessarily sit in a room and be bored shitless by people using pedagogies and content and technologies which are alien to them. It's the worst form. It's the worst form of abuse that you can get is to put people through that. So what are some strategies? On the next slide, you can see that stackable programs or shorter programs that provide credentials allow learners to experience early successes. Um, operating in ways that attract and retain adults by validating their life and work experiences um, can help, especially when we look at prior learning assessments. And our quote at the bottom really supports those first two bullets. And then offering programs and courses with academic and non-academic support available beyond the hours of traditional, the traditional day. So this goes back to our um, institutional barriers where we know that our adult learners need flexible schedules because they might have competing priorities during the typical workday. On the next slide, we'll very quickly um, look at attainment of associate's degree or higher by ages 24 to 64. And if you click to animate, Again, we can see the disparity where um, Asian and Pacific Islanders and whites really um, have more, are more likely to have an associate's degree or higher than African Americans, American Indians, or Hispanics. On the next slide, uh, we understand that multiple learning forms are necessary to attract and retain adult learners. We look at formal learn, learning being result, learning that results in a recognized diploma or credential. Non-formal learning, it takes place in the workplace or in an educational setting, but does not typically lead to a formal credential. And informal learning takes place in everyday life, but is not necessarily, and is not necessarily intentional um, to education, but it does contribute to someone's knowledge. So this might be reading a book or watching the news or reading a newspaper. 
And what we've learned is that all three forms of learning should be available to adults of all ages to ensure they have access to learning opportunities that are comfortable and relevant. On the next slide, we'll just um, show that if you were to, we, um, this survey asks respondents, if you were to enroll in education or training in the next six months, what would be your goal? And if you click to animate, you can see that the majority of individuals are looking for more non-formal learning opportunities. If you click again, 63% of adults consider enrolling, um, who are considering enrolling prefer non-degree programs. And this really was similar to what we found in our research. Moving on to the next slide. We just have a summary slide here. And I think we can wrap here due to time. If you wanna go ahead and click through the summary slide. Um, this will be available for individuals to review, but again, want to be aware of time. So moving on, you can see our references. And on the next slide, we just want to acknowledge that the research reported here was supported by the Institute of Education Sciences, U.S. Department of Education. And I think that wraps up my portion. Thank you. And we're holding questions to the end. All right, thank you very much. Good afternoon, good afternoon, everybody. Um, our presentation is Order Adapt Peer Specialist Role in Offsetting the Impact of Social Distancing During the COVID-19 Pandemic. My name is Mbi Tambao, and I'm uh, a PhD candidate at Siemens University in the School of Social Work. And I'll have my colleague uh, introduce herself. Hi everyone, I'm Karen Fortuna and I'm Assistant Professor of Psychiatry at Dartmouth College and I work with peer support specialists around the world in developing and delivering um, uh, technologies uh, to support their employment. Thank you. Next slide. So other adult peer specialists are a Medicaid reimbursable workforce with a lived experience of aging, with mental health issues. This workforce has shown uh, to improve clinical outcomes, such as feelings of loneliness, as well as behavioral health um, issues, such as depression and anxiety, all of which we know have been on the rise due to COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide. Other adults during the pandemic have had higher risk from COVID-19. Older adults are at risk from COVID mainly due to their housing options. Um, many of our older adults are homeless, living in group settings or in nursing facilities. Since the pandemic, data is showing that 40% of the COVID-19 deaths in the United States have been linked to a nursing facility. Older adults with mental health conditions experience comorbid physical health conditions, premature nursing home admissions, and an early mortality compared with the general population of older adults. A 2020 CDC report showed that eight out of the 10 COVID-19 deaths have been of older adults age 65 and older. Older adults also comprise a growing proportion of the homeless population and it is estimated that the homeless population age 65 and older will triple by 2030. Next slide. The impact of COVID-19 on older adults has been significant. There has been an increase in stress, fear and anxiety, uh, an increase in depression, as well as an increase in um, isolation due to the quarantine and social distancing policies. A lot of issues with grief and loss, which are understandable, seeing that the majority of uh, the deaths have been in older adults. We've also found an increase in substance use. Substance use is being used as a way to cope there's been a reduction in their resources and availability of transportation that they would utilize for medical uh, treatments as well as um, psychotherapy and limited access to these services, limited access to psychotherapy. Older adults also lack uh, insurance coverage, as you most of you are aware. Um, most older adults that are 65 and older depend on Medicare for insurance and 
Medicare is limited in terms of provider coverage with not covering LMHCs, licensed addiction counselors. So that has also um, been a significant impact on this population. Next slide. Aaron. Yes, so what's really exciting about this group of there, it's an older adult workforce that has, you know, a lived experience of a mental health challenge and they are hired and trained and providing these really amazing support services um, to individuals out there um, in the community. Many of these individuals, it may be their first time um, having a job, um, having lived with a mental health challenge their entire lives. Other individuals may have been in the workforce um, and then had mental health challenges and are now re-entering the workforce. And so um, it's really exciting um, to see that, you know, um, there's groups out there that are able to offer these employment opportunities for this uh, specific population. And so um, with this, older adults, uh, they're actually now engaging in digital peer support. And this is actually, this started before the COVID-19 crisis. And so digital peer support is defined as live or automated support services offered through some type of technology media. So that could be a video conference, it could be a telephone. Uh, in some cases, like through the Veterans Administration, it could be through video games. Um, and so uh, our team uh, has developed a uh, digital peer support certification um, specifically for all peer support specialists, which there's about 40,000 in the United States. Um, and now there's about 3,000 older adult peer support specialists within the United States. And so with this, we incorporate adult learning theories uh, to train people in how to use technology who may have had a lower level of technology um, throughout uh, technology adoption throughout their um, you know, lifespan. And so through this uh, training, we've been able to increase knowledge, confidence, and capacity to offer these services and to really offset, potentially offset, some of these um, outcomes that we're seeing related to COVID, such as loneliness um, and social uh, isolation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, can you go forward once more? Uh, so some of the benefits of this are that, you know, they are integrated, this group is integrated within many clinical um, provider agencies. And so they could be working alongside psychologists, medical doctors, psychiatrists, um, social workers, nurses, also community health workers. Um, there's a large proportion of older adult peer support specialists working for the VA and also the non-VA. And they also work in a lot of different settings. So within digital peer support, some are working with um, commercial enterprises. And so they're offering support service throughout uh, the United States. Others are working within psychiatric settings or even primary care settings settings such as a hospital, um, some of which are in community settings where people are actually working from home or going out into the community to offer support services. There's been some an increase in older adult peer support specialists working with aging services population to help or support older homebound older adults that may have some mental health challenges uh, related to feelings of depression or loneliness. And there's also some work with the um, opioid use disorder um, and discharge related uh, to emergency rooms. And next slide, please. Uh, so there's actually 3,000 uh, trained uh, uh, digital peer support specialists um, throughout um, the world, um, and it's really exciting that you know we're able to offer really great employment for these this population, um, and they actually, they help service users or patients around challenges related to mental health. And what we're finding with some emerging evidence, which is really exciting, through the employment and offering these support services, we're seeing older adult peer support specialists. We're seeing decreases in their um, challenges related to psychiatric symptoms and decreases related to loneliness among them. Themselves. And so you have this really neat bi directional effect. Uh, next slide, please. And I'm going to pass it back over to my uh, colleague to talk about a study we just completed. Thank you. So, a study that we completed um, was looking at older adult peer support specialist age related contributions to peer supported integrated medical and psychiatric self management. Some of uh, what we found was that, you know, um, as older adult peer specialists, they're simultaneously managing mental health and physical health issues through empowerment and technology. Um, they're realizing new capabilities in their late life by learning new skills, 
um, in late life related to technology and different coping mechanisms, different coping skills. We also found that they, uh, through sharing their role as uh, parents and grandparents, that shared experience was leading to strong interpersonal communication through self-disclosure. Um, and they were able to um, provide wisdom through the shared living uh, experience of normal age-related changes, which was uh, beneficial to the older adults that they were working with. Next slide. So for recommendations, so what we're recommending is incorporating older adult peer specialists into the existing workforce of providers. Uh, we know that demand for behavioral health uh, services has increased and will continue to rise, and the supply of trained behavioral health providers is and will not be able to meet the need. Older adults are peer, uh, older adult peer specialists are an integral part of the service delivery system of older adults. We found that the collaborative non-directive approach that is taken by the older adult peer specialists offer key experiential contributions that are important to successful aging with a mental health condition. Research shows that older adult peer specialists have a proven record of improving clinical outcomes, such as community tenure, increasing quality of life, reducing psychiatric symptoms, hospitalization, decreasing burden of the medical system and improving feelings of loneliness and loss associated with aging. So based on all the data that we have or the research on the, on the outcomes of this profession, of, of this workforce, we believe that older adult peer specialists may serve a vital augmentative role in the treatment of older adults with medical and psychiatric issues and hence should be incorporated into um, existing workforce of providers. Next slide. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to remind everyone that there is a chat and question um, um, availability for you. So please um, take advantage of that. Jennifer Kraft Morgan <clears throat> and Elizabeth Burgess will be speaking on micro learning for low wage workers in nursing homes. Jennifer actually was not able to attend today because of some technical issues, but she did send us her audio file um, to play. So I will play that now. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Craft Morgan. I'm an associate professor at the Gerontology Institute at Georgia State. And we're going to be talking to you today about micro learning for low wage workers in nursing homes. Next slide. We have no commercial relationships to disclose. So, so today I want to talk to you a little bit about how we conceptualize job quality and then how it reflects the social value. So I want to talk a little bit today about employability and shifting risk. So we've heard a lot in the organizational and occupations literature about how risk is shifting from employers to employees and how employers um, need to be more flexible. Um, and this employability that we have is individuals actively accumulating human, cultural, and social capital to maintain and find employment in today's unstable economy. And those investments that those workers make include undergo, undergoing training and acquiring skills credentials, doing the identity work around um, job finding, networking, and often unpaid labor. So we encourage people to volunteer or do internships to, to get the experience they need to actually have a job. Uh, and this onus, this burden of employability has shifted to the individuals and in many cases also including the lowest wage workers. This is also borne by older and often incumbent workers in terms of advancement and employment change. Next slide. You hear a lot of talk about direct care work and bad jobs. And certainly in many aspects, there are they are bad jobs. They have low pay, few benefits and few career opportunities, high workload. And that's usually where the conversation ends. But as we've seen with the COVID-19 pandemic, there's other aspects of job quality that are actually pretty important to having um, people be able to get what they need out of their jobs. 
Uh, low levels of flexible work practices are particularly difficult. Uh, low inclusion into teams and low staff empowerment. Lack of supervisory support is super difficult when we're talking about people balancing work and family in this new strange reality where students are home with their parents. Um, and paid time off. Paid time off is huge uh, for low wage workers. Uh, if they do not have paid time off, um, it becomes really difficult to deal with illness. And that's only gotten more difficult when we put people on 14 day. The interesting thing about direct care work is that if you ask direct care workers, uh, they report very high levels of job satisfaction. And that job satisfaction drives um, in our research and in others uh, research derives really from intrinsic rewards. So um, people get that satisfaction from having uh, relationships with clients and being able to meet the needs of people that they care about and doing that really important care work. And um, turnover, on the other hand, is impacted by extrinsic rewards, these, these things that make the job low, uh, low pay, few benefits, high workload, these things that make the job bad jobs. Next slide, please. So the project that we're gonna be talking a little bit about today is a collaborative between academics, practice experts, advocates, and employer associations and the nursing homes throughout Georgia. Um, and the point of this project is to lay the groundwork of understanding so that change, so that change in the culture of long-term care can, can take place. And the focus is often on making life better for residents, which is an important focus. And we try to shift the conversation from quality of care to real quality of life, to have residents who have choice and determination and who can live full and happy lives. But my argument is that we need to treat the workers well. The workers, the frontline workers who deliver 70 to 80 percent of the care of these residents, if they're not whole and happy, the chances of us transforming the culture of long-term care are really doomed. Uh, workers need better supports, <laughs> extrinsic and intrinsic, and they need employment supports. They need pathways to be able to find better jobs or to create better jobs in the, out of the jobs that they already have. So um, I'm gonna talk more about the data uh, on a Friday GSA presentation um, on dementia care. You're welcome to come and join us there um, Friday afternoon. But um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the conceptualization of things for this presentation. So next slide, please. We have created microlearning. And what is microlearning? Well, microlearning is three to five minute videos in our case that cover a basic concept or cover a concept that is often misunderstood or maybe overlooked. Like we all know what person-centered care is, let's not talk about it. But the meaning of person-centered care, the application of person-centered care, the underlining of key dementia statistics, the support for understanding key, you know, pivotal information that can help sort of change people's mindsets about what's important. Um, what are the values and principles of the pioneer, for example? So we have plenty of playlists, um, I think about six, that um, organize these videos on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, you can Google Culture Change Network of Georgia and see all of these. Um, we will, by the end of the project, have about 50 of these micro learning videos. Um, and these can be used in in-service education. They can be used just on social media. They can help you sort of set um, your values and understanding framework uh, in the long-term care organization. Next slide, please. The one um, series that I wanted to draw your attention to that might be useful to this audience is our diversity inclusion series. Um, we talk about supporting elders and staff equally. Um, we talk about race and ethnicity, age, sexism, sexual identity, intersectionality, in really broad and basic terms that sort of help 
start the conversation in long-term care organizations. And then in addition to all of the videos that we've created, we've created a set of um, learning modules that we're calling Culture Change Matters. Next slide, please. And this is a series of onboarding or continuing education that focuses on both relationships and empowerment of CNAs um, and other direct care and support associates. So when I say direct care and support associates, it includes housekeeping and dietary, um, all of the people who are on the front line that um, have direct relationships with uh, residents in nursing homes. Uh, we have 12 hours of content for direct care and support associates and another eight hours of content for supervisors. The supervisors in the process of doing the education also review the content of the direct care and support associates. And this is developed with all adult learning principles in mind and helps us sort of set the stage for culture change um, at a nursing center to be able to help them speak the same language and be on the same page about the importance of supervisory support and supervisory coaching, uh, the importance about developing relationships not only with residents but among staff, um, and just helping them to um, get started in reframing the value of direct care work. Um, and hopefully it lays the ground for other employer of choice strategies, other things that employers could do to make themselves more attractive uh, to new applicants, but also um, help them to um, create career opportunities for direct care workers. Next slide, please. So really we need to shift the risk off workers. This employability intensifies the obligations of low wage workers. The shift in employability increases the burden that's placed on already pressed workers. Um, and the burden of career advancement can really heighten employability tension for workers. And our older workers have different employability risks related to age discrimination, proximity, retirement, and benefits. And I think we need to think deeply and do more research in this area to help understand what older workers face in the job market. Finally, I think their employers can lighten this load through employer supports and coming through on promise rewards. COVID-19 has increased the risk for workers uh, beyond traditional job quality markers. Health insurance, intensified health risk, sick leave, personal leave, all have become um, even more important than they were before. Employers can use innovative educational strategies like microlearning and continuing education centered on adult learning pr principles and taking advantage of technology to tie these things to credentials uh, and try to shift risk off of employers. Um, and of course, other employment of choice strategies are important here. And finally, we've seen that social and economic inequalities have been laid bare. And this isn't about just one thing. It's not just about education strategies or employer strategies. This has to be whole scale societal change in terms of the value of drug care, in the value of old, older workers and low wage workers. And we need to develop a system that includes um, employment supports to balance this risk and to create employers of choice. Thank you. And my contact issues on this final slide. Um, I'd love to hear from you. All right, next slide, please. There we go. All right, thank you. I want to um, really thank the presenters for being able to um, go through their presentations and the time that we had. We do have some questions, a couple of questions from um, the chat. I'll start in the order um, in which you presented, starting with um, um, Abby. <laughs> um, Abby, you talked a lot about, you know, situational um, barriers and you presented a number of strategies. Would you call those strategies policy recommendations, just so we're clear on the language that you're using? Thanks for that question, uh, Kendra, or whoever posed the question from the audience. Um, I, do, I do think that some of those strategies 
uh, our policies in other countries. So, for example, when we were talking with our key informants, they, they some of theirs were government policies as far around how governments fund their education opportunities. And some of them are strategies more maybe on an institutional level. So when we're thinking about, you know, expansion of Pell, then that can be both institutions and state officials thinking about that. But if we're thinking about, you know, establishing strategies to support diverse needs of adult learners, then, you know, we're thinking more about on the institutional level, what are institutions able to provide um, themselves and what are they working with other community organizers uh, or community organizations to provide. So a lot of what we heard from our key informants were around wraparound services that were needed by uh, under typically underserved students. And some of those are things we typically think of that would link to education, like assistance with tutoring or uh, the need for computers or hotspots if they didn't have internet access, or, and I already mentioned, funding for tuition or books or living expenses. But what we heard is some additional services that we might not always think of, especially uh, child care services and transportation, but also housing and food insecurity came up. And so we don't always think about learning institutions, having strategies to um, overcome those barriers for, for learners like housing and food insecurity. Some of the institutions have strategies or um, opportunities on site, resources on site, like food banks actually on their campuses, but many partner with other uh, organizations in order to offer those services. Um, so I think what we provided around strategies are a combination of both strategies uh, at the institution level as well as policies, um, some of them at the state and federal levels. Awesome, thank you. You also had a question from the chat from Sankayo um, Kwan that it was very timely and specific and I'll just ask that um, you two follow up with each other um, outside of the webinar so that they can get that specific answer if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, our contact information is available and I'll drop it in the chat as well. Thank you. So next, um, there's a question about the peer support specialist. Um, Carla has a question about what is the average age of older adult peer support specialists and how do they receive their certification and who pays for it? Yeah, uh, Kendra, these are uh, great questions and, and thank you so much and I'm glad there's an interest in this area. And so uh, with, what's great about this group is that they are actually Medicaid uh, reimbursable in 47 uh, different states around the country. And uh, the certification is at a state level. So each state has their own certification process. And so um, with the traditional certified peer support specialist training, there is another training on top of that um, that really gets into the older adult peer support specialist training, which speaks to normal aging, uh, mental health challenges as individuals age, using technologies and, you know, mitigating normal aging challenges um, in accessing and use of these technologies. And so um, this is actually um, a built on top of that and states uh, will generally pay for that. Um, some exciting news uh, is that uh, there's also one program um, that is Medicaid reimbursable specifically for the older adult program um, coming out of Massachusetts for this group. And the average age of individuals um, to become an older adult peer support specialist, individuals are age 50 uh, years and older. And the reason that uh, these individuals are aged, not the traditional um, 65 years and older, is that because people with serious mental health issues related to a diagnosis of schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or treatment refractory major depressive disorder, they actually die up to 32 years earlier than the general population. And so um, we define this group as six, uh, 50 years and older rather than 65 years um, and older. And some really exciting news coming out of Medicare is that uh, there's some policy work going on to get this um, as something as Medicare uh, reimbursable for individuals um, who have uh, opioid use disorder challenges. I uh, hope that answers your question. Thank you.
Jackie, I believe you had a question for Elizabeth. Um, let's see, I did, but I wanted to follow up with um, Karen and Mabita. Uh, someone asked, what's the blue in the um, map of the world in Australia? Can you explain that quickly? Yeah, sure. So that's super, that's really exciting. And so I, I apologize. So we, we've we been doing train the trainers. And so the blue is actually the train the trainers. And so they are um, permitted uh, and encouraged to train their entire uh, state. And so that is actually uh, Sydney um, and Brisbane is where they're training their entire um, uh, states in um, the older adult uh, program. Um, and we recently were working with a large health plan where this is being rolled out uh, to 40 different states across the country. Um, and we're doing some additional testing, uh, empiricals, empirical testing around. Um, we know we can train older adult peer support specialists to deliver these programs and to use technology. Um, and we're getting some positive uh, results around um, the impact of this on uh, service users. And so we're doing a larger study, um, a pre-post uh, study uh, within um, the state of Massachusetts coming up in a few months uh, to look at uh, more clinical outcomes uh, related to this for individuals related to both older adult peer support specials and how it impacts them um, and also service users around clinical outcomes, implementation outcomes, and also around, um, you know, how individual social support changes throughout the process. Thank you. Thank you for that. And um, moving on, I do have a question for Elizabeth. And thank you, Elizabeth, for pitching in uh, with your colleague, Jen, today. Uh, that was definitely a very impressive set of learning activities, and I think they will be beneficial to all our listeners. Um, my question is, what do you, who do you think the stakeholders are that need to be involved in creating solutions for improving job quality for these uh, direct care workers, especially uh, those who are immigrants and those who have been affected um, so powerfully by this uh, recent pandemic? Thank you for that question. And I, I want to extend my apologies um, or Jen's apologies for not being here. Um, she's available if you want to reach out for her to her or to, uh, to me about any of those issues. I think the stakeholders in, in this are the employers, um, but they're also anybody who works in the in this industry employers of choice are really the ones that are thinking beyond the just salary. Obviously, a living wage is an important issue in any profession. And for these frontline workers, um, they often don't have that. And we're, we're still seeing that. But employers recognizing the need to be innovative and creative. And I think that's something we're seeing across all three of these talks. I was As I was listening to everyone, I was hearing these needs for um, different types of education and different types of support networks to, to create opportunities for older workers, for immigrant workers, for disadvantaged workers. And this includes things like flexibility, um, like empowering workers in the workplace, but it also recognizes that the lowest wage workers, the most disadvantaged workers, don't have the opportunity to pay for things themselves. So um, instead of tuition reimbursement, is there a tuition remission program? So reimbursement requires an outlay of money for someone to get paid. But if you don't have that outlay of money, then you can't do it. Is there a way for employers of choice to partner with educational institutions to pay that money up front or to pay it after a course is taken? To do these kind of micro learnings that we're creating in this program that require employers to, to buy into it, to create it as part of their onboarding or as part of their regular training. Um, so having these employers themselves and the professional organizations is a big part of it. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Kendra, do you have any other questions before we go to the wrap up? Uh, you mean for the group discussion or for the closing? Just so I'm clear. I'm sorry. <laughs> or Elizabeth. Yeah. 
Oh, no, I don't have any, another question for Elizabeth. Thank you. OK, so let's um, move to the wrap up or the discussion today. First of all, I am so appreciative to all of you for these contributions, which are incredibly inspiring and um, lead us to down the road of thinking more about the people that we don't have enough research about or see enough of. Um, and all of this work is very impressive and I, I do hope we see more of it. And I wanted to, to start the wrap up by saying to each of you, give you a chance to talk about what is the next step in your research? Where do you go from here, having um, raised so many of these important issues? I'll start with um, Abby. Thank you. Um, yeah, so our next manuscripts, we're, we're looking at uh, focusing on immigrants in, in other countries and, and um, workers who are migrating to, to other countries and uh, really focusing on that population and what, uh, what learning opportunities are available for them based on those, the policies of those countries. So um, as far as next steps with this particular project, um, that's where we're heading next. Thank you. Um, Mbita and Karen? Sure. Um, so some of the work uh, we're doing is, you know, working with older adult peer support specialists and developing uh, digital technologies um, to facilitate delivery of their services. Um, we're also um, uh, working on a, a small pre-post uh, study to explore the evidence related to training older adult peer support specialists and how it impacts them and uh, clinical outcomes. Um, and we'll continue to train people around the world um, in increasing employment uh, for this um, population. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions? Kendra, you had some wrap up questions, I think. Did you want me to talk about next steps for our project? Oh, yes, please. <laughs> That's okay. Um, we're we're really excited to be rolling out our educational modules in Georgia, and um, so we're we're going to be doing some assessment of those and hoping to roll it out across Georgia. And our next steps will be to be looking for partners in other regions to see how transferable our our educational uh, opportunities, our micro learnings, are in other other settings across other states. Excellent. Thank you so much for all of those. Um, I'm sure we all look forward to the um, continuation of these important projects. Kendra, I'll turn it to you. Yes, and actually, I don't have a question to present, but more so of a comment, something that I noticed across the entire series, and I really, really appreciate the um, presenters today for driving home um, the idea or the concern about economic security and safety of older workers. That was a common theme with Mary um, Gatta, who spoke to us um, a few weeks ago, and a common theme here. And I just really want, I really want to show my appreciation and encourage our audience members to um, you know, go back, go back to the slides, go back to the handout that you have, and think about policy strategies and recommendations that really speak to you and how you can translate that in your own research or your own concerns about older um, workers as well. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Jackie um, to close it out. If I could have the next slide, please. Is there a final slide? Um, I just want to thank all of you for, um, again, these inspiring presentations. Um, thanks to all of you who asked questions and for joining us today. I'd also like to add that if you'd like to become a member of the network, please send me an email um, to the address that I will send out and um, I will follow up with details about membership. Um, that email address is jamesjc at bc.edu. I look forward to hearing from you, and I hope all of you have a great rest of your day. Thank you for joining us. 
Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.